Hey guys, Solomon here. Hope you're having a great day. I thought today we would continue Hippo Week by covering a game from Grandmaster Samuel Sevian as he was going up against Nihal Serene in the 2022 chess.com global championships very high stakes here uh, both of these players over 3,000 rated okay i mean most of us if we break 2,000 we're happy 3,000 online is a whole different level and also shout out to my guy nick luciano uh, one of my private students as well as one of my patreon supporters he actually texted me this game and i probably wouldn't have stumbled across it uh, if it wasn't for him so shout out to you nick on top of that if you're interested in taking a look at my hippo course i'll leave a link in the description below on top of that if you're interested in becoming a patreon supporter you get a lot of benefits the most recent being that you get the two first chapters exclusively put on the patreon website and you also get a 10 percent discount on the course if you are a patreon supporter so those are just a couple of things that you can think about i put a lot of work into the course and i hope that you guys enjoy it but okay let's get into it i mean this is a big stake game here i think at this point uh, samuel Savian had three points and Savian had four so okay i mean Savian against the move d4 continues with g6 and we see the usual one two and three right bishop c4 and now a6 right looking to potentially play this move of b5 and, and just gain some space right gain some space kick that bishop around a little bit white here castles and we have e6 i am really a fan of e6 if not immediately pretty quickly after the move of bishop c4 just lock that bishop down right there's there's a lot of traps including you know if we play knight d7 here bishop takes f7 with check white is simply crushing that with knight g5 ideas so let's just not let that bishop see the light of day right play that move of e6 and then continue from here we have h6 knight d7 and interestingly enough uh, we don't see Savion continue with b5 right trying to expand down the queen side in fact white here actually brings the bishop back to d3 this is something i see all the time going up against the hippo white will play a move and then later on they're like okay i don't know what the heck to do against this and they make another move where they could have just played bishop d3 right away all right so that's one of the really one of the advantages of playing the hippo is that sometimes you have your opponent kind of shuffling the same piece over and over again now here we have an interesting choice that Sevian plays, and that's what this move of e5. And honestly, this entire hippo game is is unlike any other hippo game I've seen. Okay, now you know usually with the hippo we have our four you know middle game attacking ideas, which I outline in the course. This game is very interesting. Both sides, right? Both sides don't really attack each other too too much or too aggressively for a while. It's a lot of shuffling and a lot of strategic play. Right? Looking at pawn structure, looking at squares, and we'll break this game down. Uh, very high level game here and I, I think that we can all gain some things you know even if you're not a hippo player there's just some really solid chess here now e5 this is out of the four middle game attacking ideas that I talk about in the course this is the one that I probably use the least right playing e5 or d5 at least right away without a knight on c6 or f6 because white can simply break open the d file right and we actually see 79 have some issues with the d file in this game but of course being rated over 3000 he handles it very well. We have bishop c2 here, castle on king side, knight f1. I mean, here white, you know, just trying to transport that knight over to the king side a little bit. Now a move like g5 would probably be discouraged, at least at the moment, because of knight h5. Uh, ideas just jumping into that weak square, right? I mean, if you are going up against the hippo and you see someone play the move g5, something that you can do is go one, two, three, and four, right? Uh, obviously, you know, it takes a very good player to see that kind of maneuver, but that is an idea that, you know, white can try to play. All that being said, black is more than fine when we see this. You know, I've seen the move g5 ready to meet knight h5 with knight f6. We can play knight f6 first and then play g5, right? There's a lot of options there. But here, okay, I mean, we haven't even finished the full hippo setup yet. We're playing bishop b7. And now after bishop e3, queen e8. I thought this was an interesting choice. Uh, definitely not my top one personally. I think that knight c6 is just a very clean. You know, if queen d2, king h7, right? Tuck that king. This is a very good square here, especially because there's a pawn on e4, so this bishop is not staring down the king directly, and uh, it's not going to be doing that anytime soon. And okay, I mean, maybe rook a d1 is what Seviano is worried about, but in this case, we just have knight d6, queen e7, rook a d8, very clean, and really just dead even position for black, right? But here, instead, again, of, of that knight maneuver, we see queen e8, and then the move of knight c8. And, you know, the reason that I'm not the biggest fan of this is because he plays queen e7 pretty shortly after where he could have, you know, saved a tempo by just playing knight c8, queen e7, right? All that being said, okay, knight d2, and now h5, right? Expanding. 
on the king side and now a5 expanding on the queen side as well this is almost starting to look like a crab opening right now the crab opening is when you you start out with a5 and h5 right and you try to make space on both sides of the board hence the you know the whole crab idea and um you know and this this has its time in its place but it's really not good at the beginning stages of the game because you know g5 and b5 are extremely weak even here the square of g5 could become a target right i mean you know white's bishop staring straight at it but at the same time i mean at the moment if you do put your bishop there do we care not really right the bishop's not supported by knight we can kick it out when we're whenever we really want to and then a5 here you know the square that it weakens is the square of b5 but in this case i mean there's no knight on c3 there's no bishop on d3 i suppose the bishop can come to a4 which is actually a pretty solid move for white uh, but all that being said, I mean, by playing a5 here, we're just gaining some space, and we're also looking at bishop a6 ideas, and by playing h5, we're looking at bishop h6 ideas. I love this idea in the hippo at some point, playing h5 or a5, and then, you know, trying to kind of maneuver your bishop to another diagonal. If they spend, you know, the way that I usually put it, if they spend all that time pushing in the center, locking things down, just push a pawn, right? Bring your bishop to a6 or h6, or even bring it back to its starting square, and you're going to have a more active minor piece. But okay, here we have rook d1. The queen now steps up to e7, supporting knight c5, right? We don't want, you know, the bishop to take and, you know, us in return to get terrible pawn structure. So we play queen e7 first, trying to support that knight. We have queen f2, and now the maneuver of knight e6 and f4, right? Nice little maneuver here from black, right? d7, c5, e6, f4. White captures off here, and now the move of knight e2. Now, something that's a good question to ask yourself, not just in the hippo, but in chess in general, is what pieces of mine are not the best? And even if they are good, I mean, what pieces can I improve here, right? I mean, think of it by a piece-by-piece -piece basis, not just my whole position. How do I make my position better? Guys, the position is built from the pieces, right? The chess piece is the building block, right? The foundation of your entire position, right? Each piece plays a role. So in this case, I mean, on top of the fact that our pawn f4 is threatened, you know, I would say this bishop on g7 it's not a bad bishop, right? I mean, it's looking all the way down to c3, but at the same time, it's not doing a ton. Uh, it's not posing that much of a threat to the white camp. I mean, c3 is very locked down and covered well. There's really not going to be any future, in which case we dislodge that pawn because this b6 pawn would have to push. And again, b5 is weak, right? Notice, chess is so interconnected and everything affects the other, right? With the pawn on a6, maybe we could think about something like this at some point. But with the pawn on a5, this just can't happen, right? b5 is too weak. So, okay, first off, yeah, the, the, pawn is, the pawn is weakened, but the bishop also isn't the best. In this case, we actually see a nice little maneuver, but pretty simple idea. One, two, and three, right? Attacking the queen and really getting that bishop active on the king side. And that's what we see in a row. One, two, and three, right? Attacking the rook. You know, here Serene had to play queen e2, then rook f1, trying to save his material. And uh, now black's in an interesting spot. I mean, usually in the hippo, we don't see a knight on c8, and it's usually good right that we don't see a knight on c8 uh, but the issue here is that if we try to get our knight into the game which also frees up our a rook e5 is played and our knights kind of just force straight back right to the edge of the board and that's not really what we want there so here we have the move of knight a7 here Sevian probably wanting to get in the move of knight c6 looking to trade down and you know get our position a little bit less cramped get this rook involved but now we have the move of bishop a6 right now white is able to barely get this in because the rook does not attack that square but okay, we just take back, bring the rook over to d8, and we now play a4. And uh, yeah, I mean, here, a3. This is also, you know, specifically in the crab opening, we see this more, right? h5, a5, gaining space. You're only two moves away from throwing upon h3 or a3. Um, but even, you know, in the non-crab positions, non-hippo positions, this is, you know, a, a strategy I see grandmaster players using all the time. From move one, if you move any other pawn, right any other pawn besides the a or the h pawn that pawn is affecting two different squares right that pawn is affecting two different squares two squares are not so well defended or covered anymore right but you push harry the h pawn right or you push the a pawn down the board only one pawn only one square is weakened and that really kind of gives our pawns range and the flexibility to kind of just throw down uh, one side of the board and look to trade off for a b or a g pawn right so here black looking to play a3 a damaging white's pawn structure while really not damaging ours so okay here we have a3 from white preventing it bishop f6 attacking the knight knight c6 
Queen b5, knight e5. I mean, black doing very well here. Rook a5, kicking that queen back. Uh, we have c6, very solid play here. I mean, it's just it's just hard for white to really do anything here. We have king h1. White probably just didn't see much of an opportunity to play, you know, attacking chess here. So they're like, okay, I'm going to play prophylactically, play king h1 so that this diagonal or queen c5 check idea is just won't even be an option for Sevillon going forward in the game. But okay, we now have b5, queen e6. And now c takes b5. Now, in the game we have rook takes b5, uh, c takes b5 would be a mistake. This is really a good idea that we didn't do this. And of course, some may be wondering, wait, I mean, you know, with rook takes, we have two isolated pawns. At least with c takes, we don't have any isolated pawns. Well, that's true. But remember, guys, sometimes in chess, you can't follow all the rules at once. Sometimes you got to make a choice, right? Do I want isolated pawns or do I want an inactive piece, right? Uh, rules are rules are important. They're helpful. Uh, it's good to kind of try to avoid weak pawn structure, but at the same time, uh, every situation calls for its own interpretation and analysis of the position. In this case, by playing C takes, sure, we don't have isolated pawns, but what did we just give up, right? What did we just weaken? The square of D5, right? That knight just jumps in there. I mean, octopus knight, and it's just annoying for Black to have to deal with. I mean, Black still has a fighting chance here for sure, but I mean, at least in the near future, the only way to get rid of this guy is to just sack for it, right? And that's just annoying. We don't want to do that. On top of that, our rook on a5 is, is somewhat awkward. I mean, it's probably not going to have to move anytime soon, but at the same time, like the moment it does, b5 is very weak, right? Um, so b5, even though it's not isolated, still a target. Okay, so going back, we have rook takes b5 instead. I think that these pawns are much less of a target than the pawn on b5 would have been. And on top of that, d5 is covered, right? But okay, we have knight b1, rook b8, doubling up, forming, forming that battery ram on the b-file. Knight c3, rook a5, uh, king g7 here. You know, just this is just like a 3,000 level player move, right? Just, okay, march the king up. And uh, okay, rook goes over to d1. Again, guys, ask yourself, how can I improve the positioning of my pieces? We actually have a pretty good knight on e3. It's a good piece, right? There's no, there's no, uh, there's no debating that, but it would be better on e3, right? So let's do it. Let's play knight c4. Uh, we have g5, and now the move of knight e3, right? Attacking the rook, g4, Sevillon continuing to advance here. Great position out of the hippo. And, uh, okay, I mean, here we have c5, knight d5. Um, and th this is all, this is all solid. However, at this point, I think, uh, we, we have a mistake here from Sevillon up to this point. He's played a great game. He plays a move of Bishop G five though, which isn't the best option. Instead, what he should have done was captured on D five, right? Captured on D five. And, uh, I mean, okay, there's, you know, a couple options here. If you want to take with the Rook, we'll probably just take on H three and try to blast open that King side position, right? And okay, I mean, if you take on d5 with the pawn, in this case, we're almost minus two here in the evaluation, which I myself was a little bit surprised by. But I think the reason for that is because we can take and then play g3. Now, usually advanced pawns in the end game aren't super helpful uh, because they're targets, right? But notice our pawns, h5, g3, and f4, none of them are, are really weak, right? None of them are weak. Uh, they're all together. Uh, they're also on dark squares, which we have a dark squared bishop, which is great for us, right? It makes them very easily defendable. And at the end of the day, white really has to be worried about back rank mate threats, right? There's nowhere for this king to run on h2 or f2. So this king's going to have to try to get out to f1 before these rooks are even able to leave the first rank. In the meantime, in the meantime we're going to get busy, right? Let's just say white plays something like knight c3, right? Looks like a playable move. Let's take that thing right off. Take the thing off right if the rook takes back a double up if you want to defend rook b3 right and white's in trouble here right white's in trouble uh we have two rooks on this pawn so you know if you want to move one of your rooks we're just going to snatch it off i mean if you want to take on c5 we can snatch this thing off and then we're going to be threatening mate on b1 white's going to have to go back and they're just playing defensive chess we're going to start picking off pawns like they're candy and if you kind of just make a move defending the pawn on t5 notice guys uh, is, you know, obviously a rook can't jump over a pawn, but if it could, we would simply win the game, right? So we have this ability of taking on a three. And this is kind of the thing, just from a practical standpoint, I mean, you know, white here with this pawn structure and us as black having pawns on g3 and f4, this king's in trouble, right? We can take on a three, white cannot capture back. 
because we have check and uh, you're up a rook, but you got to give up your rooks and really just get back rank mated. Black wins that there, right? So, okay, going back to knight d5, Sevian should have captured on d5, captured the queen, played g3, locked that game up, and white there would be on the defensive. But instead, we see this move of bishop g5. Okay, now here, Serene just takes on e3. Uh, we have knight takes e3. And now rook b3, again, I think that c4 is probably the best move for black. Now, this move, in my opinion, is much, much less easy to find, right? Not a human move. Uh, especially in an online format, which is a quicker time control. Um, but this is what Stockfish recommended, and I kind of like the idea because going back, you know, we're, we're worried. We're worried about this move of knight f5 with check, right? This is annoying. If we take with the bishop, the queen captures back, and our, and our king's still pretty opened up, and we're down a pawn, right? Not the best situation there. Uh, at least immediately we're down a pawn, and, and we have a lot of weaknesses, and pawns kind of floating all over the place. But with this move of c4, notice, if you want to play knight f5 with check, we have a defender. We have a defender, right? The rook slides over, and uh, the pawn can take. Okay, we take the queen, and finally, the bishop has access to that rook on c1, right? Nice idea there. But okay, c4, if white sees that, that we can just take the knight, then take the queen, and then take the rook, going up a bunch of material, and really just having a, uh, a one game there. And plays a move like knight takes c4. Uh, it actually turns out that rook c5 is the best move here. And there's some value, guys. Um, not always in immediately capturing a piece. Most of the time you do this, right? If you see a rook for a bishop, I mean, let's go up the exchange. But sometimes there's some value in keeping the tension, right? Uh, this is something that one of my uh, old friends, uh, Grandmaster Kachian, used to say when I would go to camps and stuff. Um, keep the tension, right? Uh, this is not the last chance we're going to have to take a rook. It's just not. Right. This rook is pinned to the rook on c1. This knight is pinned to the rook on c1. Even a move like this, let's take the rook off and continue pinning white. Right, We got one, two, three major pieces clamping down on that knight. No defense is available. We're simply crushing. Right, But okay, going back to knight takes e3. c4 was an idea there that really does keep the pressure on white and it sounds... Uh, I think it's about plus 0 0.8 if white plays it correctly, but obviously very easy for white to slip up there. And that rook also becomes a nice defending piece for the king side of the board, which is helpful. But instead we have rook b3, knight f5 check, the king goes over, and now rook d6. Black is all of a sudden in some trouble. At one point the hippo had, you know, a great position, but uh, I think that bishop g5, you know, tiny little slip up, you're, you know, you're going you're gonna to pay for it going up against someone like Serene. But okay, in this in this case, uh, we actually see some crazy chess here. Black goes, okay, I'm going to give up my queen, but in return, I'm going to get one and two rooks, and now I'm going to be attacking your knight, right? Attacking this knight on f5. Um, you know, white white could have played a move like knight g3, but we can take on f3 and then take on b2. I think, you know, here Serene's like, look, I'm trying to play active. I mean, you know, sure. Uh, this position might be even immaterial, but uh, black has a lot of pieces floating around. I'm going to play queen d1. Here's the idea, right? If we take on b2 or just, you know, get cute and try to go up a pawn, uh, you know, instead of taking the knight. Uh, in that case, we have queen d7 with check. And guys, the, the queen and the knight are the most dangerous combo in chess, right? Um, and sure, you can make an argument. And I've thought about this quite a bit. You know, okay, queen and rook, sure. But th there's just some things that a knight and a queen can do that just simply that we just simply don't see in chess, right? Because a queen can move like a bishop. It can move like a rook, but it can't move like a knight. So when you combine a queen and a knight, you're really combining all all types of moves that any chess piece can make, and they have some beautiful combinations. Um, I mean, in this case, no matter what black does, we're going to keep creeping towards that king and just going to, I mean, mate this game pretty quickly. Um, there's just, yeah, there's just a lot of different ways that, that we can win there. Uh, but with this move of king g6, I just wanted to mention, right, don't play this and think you have mate, right? If white plays this, they're actually forcing black to take a queen. Okay, I don't know about you, but I don't really want to force my opponent to take my queen. I don't want that to be their only move, at least most of the time, right? Uh, maybe Eric Rosen would, would find some situation where he could pull something off. But okay, I mean, queen takes e6 with check. Um... Yeah, there's just there's just no way out of this, right? 97 is the best move. They're the quickest mate. There, there's other ways to win, but the main idea now is that okay, queen g8 is on the way, knight g6 is on the way. You can stop one, but you can't stop both, right? So okay, going back, queen d1. 
uh, Stevion here is going, you know what, I don't even want to mess with that. I'm just going to take that knight right off the board. And now we have queen d7 with check. And surprisingly, we have a draw here. White, you know, continues to check, check, and we have a threefold repetition. Um, it turns out, though, that white can actually just kind of keep stepping away with the queen, right? Step away, step away. And notice if the king goes back to any of these three squares, we play queen c7 with check and we win a rook, right? And here, if black plays a move like king g5, right, which is the only move if you don't want to go back to the seventh rank because f5 is taken away, we have queen d8 with check and white here with a much better game. All that being said, I thought I'd share this. I thought it, you know, it's a very trippy hippo game. I mean, going back, uh, there really were some things that I hadn't really seen before, um, you know, going back to e5. Again, I usually don't rest on this very much. I usually rest more on moves like b5 and knight b6, g5, knight g6, looking at, you know, at the right moment. I think in this case, uh, c5 might be able to get pulled off. f5, not really, because the pawn takes and the rook gets active. Um, I mean, a move like knight c6 at some point could do some good. At, at, at the same time, um, e4 is pretty pretty well covered uh d4 is as well by a pawn but you know maybe some knight c6 e5 ideas at some point but okay e5 um i don't recommend opening up the file most of the time but if you do um you know going forward in the position here you do have that idea of knight c knight c8 right in the hippo right the knights aren't only going this way right this way or this way they can also they can also go backwards for the point of going to d6 or e6 so interesting idea there I mean, I think that this is a, a pretty nice way to, you know, again, one and two, um, yeah, just get a just get a solid game there as black and and continue playing some chess, right? So again, hope you all enjoyed this video. Uh, if you are interested in the course, uh, I have a link uh, to it uh, down below, and I'll see you tomorrow. Hey guys, wanted to give a big shout out to my Patreon supporters for the month of February in 2023. Appreciate you guys a ton, and if you haven't checked out the Patreon before. Make sure to go check it out. There's a lot of Patreon-exclusive benefits that you can gain, and I'd love to have you join the crew.